Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As you probably know, this session is going to be conducted in English, so let me first of all thank our speakers not only for being here today, but also for agreeing to speak in a language which may not be their first language. Um, this is basically for the benefit of those who are following us through live streaming. So let me also welcome those who are watching us from wherever they happen to be uh, for being with us today. And let me also very briefly thank José Luis de la Peña, the director of the Diplomatic Academy, Ricardo Diez Hochleitner for his assistance from the ministry, and my friend and colleague Juan Luis Manfredi from Castilla-La Mancha University for his intellectual input in organizing today's event. Now, as you can see, we have a spectacular panel, uh, very well attended, and sadly, we only have a limited amount of time, so I would like to ask our speakers to be as brief and concise, as well as being, of course, extremely brilliant, um, in their <laughs> seven-minute presentations. This is going to be fun. Um, the order that we have agreed on is, first of all, we will have Cecilia Yulin from uh, the Swedish Embassy, the Ambassador of Sweden to Spain, we will then have Monsieur Jérôme Bonafont, the Ambassador of France. Um, the third speaker will be Jane Hardy, the Australian Ambassador here in Madrid. The fourth speaker will be Loberta Lajut from uh, the uh, Mexican Embassy. Uh, then we will have Simon Manley from the British Embassy, also known as hashtag Ambassador on the Road. And finally, we will have Amy Bliss from the U.S. Embassy. She is the cultural attache at the U.S. Embassy. So thank you very much, again, all of you for your presence. What I would like to do is to make this as, as uh, lively and informal as possible. So if you could keep your opening remarks relatively brief, then we will have a discussion amongst ourselves, and then perhaps we can throw the session open to the public. Thank you. Cecilia, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, Charles, and thank you, the Instituto Elcano, for having us here, and uh, also the Escuela Diplomatica. It's, uh, for me, an honor and, uh, and a great joy to be here to present Sweden as part of our public diplomacy. Um, I would like to go back and start on February, th February the 13th, 2013. Uh, when our foreign minister, Karl Bildt, presented uh, in the Swedish parliament the government's declaration on foreign policy, and he spoke a lot about crisis in the world, he spoke about well, the importance of the European Union, he spoke about the Eastern Partnership, uh, this was before the crisis with the Ukraine and, and our relations with Russia, um, well, the Middle East and other things. Uh, but at the end of a very lengthy intervention, uh, I'd like to quote him, he said, we are continuing to modernize and improvise improve our foreign service, public diplomacy is becoming increasingly important. Therefore, before the end of the month, all ambassadors, all of our embassies will be on Twitter and Facebook. Sweden must be at the absolute cutting edge in digital diplomacy efforts. So, a lot of us were maybe not surprised, but a bit overwhelmed, and uh, we were all thrown out in the cold water or the waters of, of uh, the social media, whether we liked it or not. I think this was a natural consequence of our foreign minister's uh, great enthusiasm for, for electronic communication. He's been communicating electronically since he was prime minister in the early 90s. He prides himself of being the first head of government uh, that sent an email to another head of government when he sent an email to Bill Clinton when he had been installed as US president. Um, and uh, if we talk about public diplomacy or foreign policy, uh, openly uh, as foreign minister he has had since 2006 a blog where he blogs daily often two three times a day uh, on his views on his position on his thoughts about foreign policy on on the challenges in the world on the crisis in the world uh, it's eagerly followed i think by embassies in stockholm and and translated by most of them he, he blogs he blogs in swedish but it it certainly interests uh, a lot of people and you can say that's really foreign policy out in the open public foreign policy but it didn't start with Carl Bildt, uh, I have to say. Um, I'd like to go back a bit further to the Christmas of 2004, uh, the great catastrophe of the tsunami in Thailand and Indonesia and, and Southeast Asia, where over 540 Swedes perished and uh, some 1,500 were, were severely injured. And the Swedish government was severely criticized for lack of action, for not having a plan, for not engaging. Uh, and not only the government, especially the foreign minister. Uh, the criticism grew to such an extent that 
people, my colleagues, uh, in 2006, when they were asked, would not admit that they worked for the foreign ministry. They would say that they worked for the government offices, but not the foreign ministry. And that's never good for an organization when your <laughs> employees won't admit that they actually work for you. So uh, we embarked on a very sort of strategic and ambitious plan of public diplomacy towards our own taxpayers, our own citizens, uh, the shareholders of, of the company. Uh, and of course there, social media provided, uh, I would say, an excellent opportunity. We started chats, we started blogs, um, and, and just to give an example, we, we asked a lot of our uh, colleagues around the world to start blogging, third, second secretaries, ambassadors, uh, about their daily life to show, I think as Cecilia described a little bit, what does a diplomat do, who are we, that we, we were also human beings. And, and often very competent human, human beings. Uh, a huge success, and, and one of the first successes was our, our young second secretary who took up his first post in Jakarta. Uh, and he blogged about, I think, his expectances of being a diplomat meeting reality um, on the road in, in Jakarta. And he got a huge following of young uh, Swedes. Another example that had an effect that we had not counted on was our ambassador in Iraq was blogging and he found out that he had a lot of readers, followers among Iraqis in Sweden that were very interested in what he was doing, his views on, on developments in Iraq, that they could feed back. So all of a sudden it had also a foreign policy effect that we had not uh, counted on. Um, so that was a good uh, thing. Um, we also created our uh, an, an our own blog of the foreign ministry where we could sort of present our views um, on issues, consular issues, crisis, foreign policy issues. Uh, and we could, as we say, we were allowed to <laughs> give the full picture irrespective of if the media wanted to let us talk to a point or, or actually sort of disseminate uh, the whole picture. So we created uh, our own platform um, for information and, and uh, to create understanding of what we do. <coughs> then you can say, but isn't diplomacy something different? Isn't it supposed by definition it's something uh, discreet? Uh, and maybe it was, but I think, as we have said, all of us, I think that has changed uh, drastically. Uh, as we said today, we are all competing. Nations are competing for for the attention, for the interest, uh, among others. Uh, most ambassadors have the task of leading the promotion of, of the country's brand name. Uh, I think we are all in the business now of, of, of working with the brand name of our countries, like Coca-Cola works with, with theirs. Um, and I would say I sometimes feel that the embassy is like a communications bureau for the country of Sweden. We're there to sort of spread uh, the world. Uh, and, and as we say, w it means we do not only communicate with the government of the country where we're active. Of course, we still go and talk to the foreign ministry, the prime minister's office. We try to sort of um, drive in the, the views of Sweden, the policies of Sweden. We try to get Spanish support for our initiatives or, or candidatures or other things. That still goes on. Uh, but the difference, and uh, this is much more recent, I think, is that we, w we need to win the hearts and the minds of the general public. Um, we need to create an interest among um, important uh, people, important lobby, lobby groups, organizations, the media, young people, important um, opinion makers, or they sometimes now, in, I think, in the new lingo called facilitators. We need to co take connect with those. And hopefully they will then influence, for us, important decision makers um, in Spain. Uh, of course, we want to create uh, a positive image of our country and an interest in our country. Uh, but I think what was earlier called trade promotion or export promotion has certainly expanded or developed into something much, much uh, wider, what we took today call public diplomacy. Uh, I think it's the whole package. It's the trade promotion, investment promotion, cultural promotion, uh, the promotion of, of the trademark of the country um, and its foreign uh, policy. And for us in the social, in, in the foreign ministry, it was a very natural step to, to take this public diplomacy work into the social uh, media. We pride ourselves of being a very connected country with several companies and talking about um, indexes. We were very happy that this year we regained the top post in the network readiness index. Um, so we happily threw ourselves out in the, in, in the social media. And what is then the strategy for, for our social media work or public diplomacy in the social media? 
um, I think the aim is to reach as many as possible that we feel are interested in Sweden, uh, that are receptive to our values and policies, or that have the possibilities to help us spread our message, the, the so-called facilitators. Um, I think most ambassadors, myself, we try to disseminate news about Sweden. And I would say not only good news. I think it's important uh, that you disseminate interesting news. They Sometimes you have to uh, also talk about the bad news uh, of the country and comment it in order to have some credibility. I think that's important. Um, from my point of view, it's also important that if you Twitter, that you do it uh, in a personal way. Uh, I mean, I, I Twitter in my function as a Swedish ambassador to Spain, uh, but I try to do it uh, in a personal way, although I'm sort of bringing out the message of the Swedish government, but I think it creates more interest. It's still, I think it's important that it's a human being communicating with other uh, human beings, uh, but never to be private. I think that's out. I mean, we're still there doing <laughs> a job. Uh, and and I think it's also very good for foreign policy. I think there's sometimes a discussion about all these hashtag campaigns. Are they really worth anything? Um, uh, of course, I mean, a hashtag campaign does never solve the problem or the issue, but I think it can help very much to keep it on the table, keep uh, people's attention on the issue. Uh, I think a lot of us joined the hashtag campaign on bring back our girls, about the girls kidnapped. Um, well, we have, most of us, I think, been in the United for Ukraine campaign, which we also feel is important. And, and I think as for a Swedish ambassador, it's, it's very natural to join uh, all these campaigns to show this is where we stand on some of the issues. We started one of our own because we thought we wanted to give a stronger voice to, to freedom on the Internet. So we started a hashtag campaign on, on Internet freedom. Um, so I think these are, are good examples. Um, <laughs> and I think the, the, the important thing with the public diplomacy, especially through the social media, is that it gives you a possibility to communicate with the people. It's, it's a two-way communication. Um, and for us, I come from a country where we think transparency and openness is very important. And the fact that we can now communicate with the people, they don't all agree with our positions and, and views, but that you can have a conversation. I think that is always respected, that you, that you listen, you're out there, you're interesting, ready to take in, in their views. So I think the social media is part of the message, and it's certainly public. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir Ambassador. Thanks a lot. I'll try to speak English, though. It's not helping. Is it working now? Yes, thanks. Uh, I will try to speak English. I make so much effort trying to learn Spanish that my English is disappearing. <laughs> so you will excuse me for the fault, especially my British and American colleagues. Uh, well, first of all, there is to, to, to say that uh, the English language is very powerful because it took two words, public and diplomacy, put them together and gives a concept which is what we call in French a concept valise, which means that you can put everything in it. It's extraordinarily vague and at the same time extraordinarily efficient. And very interesting. Very interesting because public diplomacy exists since the beginning of diplomacy. If you read descriptions of embassies in the old days, you had a prince who was doing public diplomacy, who was living the court life, who was showing the power of his country. And behind, working, writing, spying, you had all the commis, commis d'ambassade, who were doing the real uh, diplomatic world. Uh, well. So you had already this difference. I will have to, I will have to make an alliance with technology. <laughs> I don't know how I will do that. You had this. You had in France, we organized the first service des oeuvres françaises à l'étranger in 1920. One of the first to lead it was a writer. You prefer... Uh, well, vous voyez, je reviens au... Les bonnes vieilles méthodes, vous voyez. Bon. Le, 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 le premier, uh, the first was Jean Giraudoux, a writer. Just before the First World War, it was called service de la propagande. Because in those days, Propaganda did not have the negative meaning that it took a couple of years later with Second World War 
with uh, all what was done with propaganda in those days. And the idea was already to install a network of cultural centers abroad to promote French and the French culture. And at the same time, because the two were mixed at that time, at the same time to promote the views of France in uh, what uh, was uh, what is called now the work of the spokesman, the spokesperson. And what is interesting to see is that First World War had an impact on all that. Because what President Wilson decided was to finish with the old secret diplomacy and to open diplomacy to the world in a spirit of democracy, in a spirit of transparency, in a spirit of accountability. And that's how what was hidden became more public. So it came to a couple of problems that we address nowadays. First of all, who is speaking? And this is an extremely important question in public diplomacy. Are you speaking as the ambassador? Are you speaking as yourself? Do you give the floor to a company? Do you give the floor to a cultural actor? Do you give the floor to an individual, a citizen? And in that case, who is speaking? Is it France who is speaking? Is it the government of France who is speaking? Is it the label France who is speaking? That is the first question you have to address very precisely when you enter in an effort of communication. And here, you have to make a separation between public diplomacy of the spokesperson who is giving the positions of your government and who has to stick to the line, and the people in the Institut Culturel, for example, who have to give you an idea of the diversity, the creativity, the innovation, the debate, the democracy, the lively things which are going on in your country. But you have to stick to this distinction and not try to mix it, because if you try to mix it, then you are trying to do propaganda using creativity for the service of uh, your government office, or polluting, if I may say, uh, the liberty of the artist or of the scientist with a political message. The second thing is, what is your message? What do you have to say? How do you want to present yourself? And here, what I think is important for France, for example, is to make sure that though there is the weight of tradition, history, and past, we are a nation of today engaged in an effort to shape the world, participate in the shaping of the world at the time of globalization, very often reluctant to some of the evolutions of this world which seem to us a divorce with our conception of humanism and of human dignity, but at the same time completely engaged in all what gives more innovation, more prosperity, more dignity, more peace and security. That is the sort of general image which then has to be developed in a thematic order. Then you have to know to whom you are talking about. You don't speak the same language to America and to Spain, or to black Africa, or to Northern Africa, or to the Middle East. You don't speak the same language to an NGO engaged in the fight for fair prices of medicine and in a Congress of Doctors. It is the reality. So you have to adapt. You have to be fair to your commitments. You have to be strong to your message but you have to be respectful to your audience and give your audience a message that this audience will understand and will not misunderstand. And the problem of misunderstanding because of the audience is a problem which is a very common one. Finally, how do you say it? I'm not going to describe all the network. I will just say that the main challenge we have now is the challenge of new technologies. And there is a huge work to do in order to master the use of new technologies in public diplomacy. Because a tweet by an ambassador, who is speaking to whom? Is it the ambassador or is it the person? And if it is using the tweet to give a, spokes a spokesperson language, frankly, there is a little problem here. And so we really have a big effort of adaptation, domestication of new technologies in order to adapt our message to that. Finally, 
un proverbe français, la plus belle fille du, la plus belle fille du monde ne peut donner que ce qu'elle a. In other words, don't try to mix, don't try to give a fake image of yourself. In public diplomacy, if you want to be efficient, you have to be yourself. Of course you will put your nice dresses and your jewels, but you have to be yourself because you will not project another image than your image and if you try to project a wrong image at some moment it will appear. President Lecold was saying you can cheat one person one life, you can cheat everybody one day, you cannot cheat everybody one life. Valise, which in Spanish I suppose would be cajón desastre. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Jane, over to you. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to hear from Cecilia and Jerome. Your uh, descriptions are, are fantastic, and I won't go over the same ground, but I'll give you some insight into the way I think and the way we run some of our programs with some examples. Uh, first of all, interesting, I, I was thinking as you were speaking, Jerome, that um, know your audience, know your message. These are very important uh, techniques. I can't hear. And, uh, and that's absolutely right. You must know who you're speaking to and why you're speaking to them and then uh, tailor your message. Technology and this is reminding me that you must never speak about issues that where you might be expressing your personal opinion while the mic is on. <laughs> <laughs> Many world leaders have actually come to grief uh, in doing so, and the same applies for tweeting, Facebook, and all of the other mechanisms, which are, after all, pencils. They are just mechanisms for getting the message out. Unfortunately, they're so good and so easy and so delightful that it's very easy to mix the public and the private message. So um, I won't go into all of our programs, but very similarly, we don't have, we don't have the grand institutions of our European cousins who France, Spain and other countries have invented much of the, uh, the soft power diplomacy that uh, is still resonant today, but we, like Sweden, have uh, we were born modern, we say. Australia was born modern in 1901 and, uh, you know, we, we pride ourselves on being on the front foot in using the latest technologies and, and overcoming what we call the tyranny of distance uh, to get our message out. Um, just turning to some of the examples, there are various things we do and our country does. We do have our, uh, our professionals who come in and provide us with, um, very well paid I might say, come and provide us with advice, uh, professional advertising people, professional image makers and so on. And we have our brand, Brand Australia. I guess our trade officials, uh, um, you associate this method of public diplomacy more with them. They have their beautiful little video clips, which, by the way, little advertisement are all linked to our website and our Facebook page at the embassy. Uh, we have our slogans. Um, Britain's ha Britain has the best slogan I've ever seen. It's Great Britain. It's the name of the country. <laughs> 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 Talk about Schutzpah. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's not actually officially the name of the country either. But um, we, we have a name which w is a Spanish name. Australia was a, a name given to our continent by the early Spanish maritime explorers. And it was adopted later on by those, um, those Englishmen who came and um, stole, stole the continent. <laughs> <laughs> it is... <laughs> because I have a Germanic background and, and blonde hair, we're often associated with Austria. So Austria has a brand name which says, no, we do not have any kangaroos. <laughs> So you can see that countries such as ours probably have to uh, try 
hard to explain our country. It explains itself in many ways, but we do try and present it through using professionals to promote the idea, the brand Australia, the openness that Cecilia talked about, the openness in our culture, in, our, uh, in the way we live, and of course uh, the beauty of our lifestyle, the things we love about being there. Um, we also have to brand our country as a smart country because some of our colonial forebears, uh, <laughs> not, not officially but unofficially, love to joke that, you know, we're the country cousins, we live on the other side of the world, we are upside down, we were originally all prisoners sent by, by courtesy of um, His Majesty or Her Majesty. Uh, we do have to overcome some of these stereotypes. It's all done in good fun and good faith. And frankly, uh, you know, we don't have to be uh, too much on the front foot on some of these issues. But there are other issues which are very, very serious issues, which we try and prosecute, we try and amplify through our various strands of, of um, media handling, uh, cultural events and so on. I'll just give a few examples. One of them Cecilia mentioned is consular work. It's extremely important at times, and in our region, uh, Cecilia mentioned Indonesia and Thailand. We, we have monsoons and, and tsunamis which affect our continent, but not so much the population, but it affects our continent and it affects our region every year. This is a seasonal occurrence. And we have to get out on the front foot with tweets, with uh, Facebook, with every message we can uh, use to reach Australians who might be travelling in places where disasters have happened. And that's become a very important tool for our consular work. For immigration, we have to help people understand our system. We do have an immigration system of visas. They're very simple visas. They're mostly done online. Uh, uh, but quite often I hear stories from young people who say, we got to Indonesia and we were hoping to get you know, a, a ferry across the, the Torres Strait <laughs> to northern Australia, but we didn't have a visa. Well, that's right. Uh, they needed to have a accessed online visas prior to uh, reaching our shores. Um, uh, that's a, just one example, but we use uh, social media um, and traditional media to get out story, um, to get out advice about immigration, um, and we have uh, lots and lots of products, including uh, cultural products, education, and so on, which we promote uh, very much through all sorts of forms. I guess. I, I would have to say, uh, with our small government budgets, um, we don't try and invent things that other people do better. So my team, we have uh, six Australians and, and 21 Spaniards working here in Madrid, and we have a, a relatively small budget, and we must enable what the arts and cultural professionals do extremely well. Uh, for example, we have um, a great cultural superpower in the country of Spain and we've recently had a major exhibition taken from the Prado to Melbourne and we, we don't do this. We don't even give them much money to do this. We do some, some work around the edges, for example, providing travel insurance. But really, the arts professionals do this. The director of the Prado Museum is a world authority on these paintings. And we are very, we are, we have to buy our culture, our European culture, and we pay, uh, uh, our state governments pay money to take these things to their capitals. So we help uh, around the edges of that and, and even just having a, an, an embassy presence at these events is, is, can be helpful and important. Um, performing artists, of course, they produce, they are, some of them are economies unto themselves. 
there's not much an embassy can do to add value to what Kylie Minogue, for example, might experience when she comes to Spain. I mean, she is a phenomenon in herself and she will have a road show which rolls along and if we are in the way, we might get run over by this road show. But no, we try and promote around the edges these great events. Uh, there are some other very serious things. We, we like to call our cultural diplomacy carne y caramelos. So there's carne, it's meat, it's serious, it's deep, and it needs a lot of work to get it right. Carne can be messaging about uh, war. It can be messaging about very serious inter intergovernmental issues, which are hard to explain. We're all foreign policy practitioners, and we know that some issues take many, many years to work through. It's the hard, detailed work. However, of course, we're, we're dealing with media which is instantaneous, 24 hours, and uh, is, is uh, often complex issues uh, are described in three or four words. So we have to master the ability to, to do that and to get out on the front foot and, and establish the message not let the media, the, the international media in particular, or even our domestic media, uh, frame what we're doing. We don't react to that. We must be out in front of it. There are some techniques we use. Uh, uh, one example, when I was in Washington, the, uh, the very sad situation of the Afghanistan war was continuing on and on. And there was an Australian army colonel who was a PhD in anthropology and one of his jobs in the army, our army, was to advise on anthropological issues surrounding the, the activities in Afghanistan, where, where our troops were and the international presence. And he became quite a celebrity in Washington and in fact he's gone over to the other, other side. <laughs> I think he's still an Australian citizen but he's come quite a, become quite a celebrity in the United States media, especially the, the big uh, international networks. Um, and there are some other delightful things. So there's Ambassador, you just, you get this power and it goes to your head and you do these things. And one of them, I adore Spanish guitar and I've created a link between Cordoba Guitar Festival and the Adelaide Festival, which Adelaide is my hometown. It's, it's similar to Cordoba. It's in a hot, dry place on the southern part of the continent, and it has a proud tradition of a big international arts festival, and we link the two festivals. So Adelaide Festival takes place in July. Cordoba Festival takes place several weeks before that, and the festivals are now working with each other to do joint uh, efforts, such as commissioning a new orchestral guitar uh, concerto, which uh, they've done and, and will be performed in each festival. And uh, the, the other more practical part, creating tourism packages. And those who travel internationally to these kinds of specialist festivals, hopefully, if they're attracted to Cordoba, will be attracted to Adelaide. So that's just in a nutshell, some of the examples, some of the issues that we deal with every day. Uh, one more example of not what to do. I, uh, I gave, a, I've, I gave um, I've enjoyed being at El Cano. Uh, Charles and Emilio have been very, very uh, uh, generous in providing me and other ambassadors with a place to workshop ideas. And I gave the first uh, speech on, or um, uh, introduction to our hosting of something called the G20, which we government officials get very excited about, but we never know whether anyone else takes any notice whatsoever. The G20, Spain is a permanent invitee, and uh, most of our countries are members. We, we did a lovely uh, Chatham House discussion on the G20 at El Cano. That was my practice run. And then I gave a, a speech in Spanish with a much longer presentation written by my G20 colleagues, translated faithfully by our lovely staff at the embassy. And it was far too long and far too technical. And then everybody was looking at their watches. And at the end of, of this event in the Ritz Hotel, I got the questions. And they were all about things like, um, can young people work and travel in Australia? 
you know, the, these, it's the human interest people are, are wanting to hear about. Um, by the way, advertisement number two, and then I'll stop. We've just signed a work and holiday visa. Mr. Garcia Magayo was in Canberra. He did two things. He opened a fantastic, uh, one of, one of our, I think it's our largest solar farm, uh, solar energy installation near Canberra, and then he signed this visa. And since that signing, we've had a thousand hits on our Facebook page, and uh, our immigra immigration staff will get overwhelmed with uh, inquiries. But um, just, you may know of young people, uh, 18 to 30 years old, who might like to go and work and study in Australia, oh, work and have fun and study if they wish for one year in Australia. Thank you very much, Jane. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's so exciting to be here and to be able to understand that it's not only me that has to face the social networks, but my colleagues as well. And it's not only the Mexican for, uh, foreign ministry that is figuring out how to use the social media and how to be their president, but every uh, other foreign affairs ministry in the world. And that brings uh, forward the whole issue about what it is being an ambassador, whether you have to combine representing your country and your country's interests and your own personality and your own way of going about, but now instantaneously in every tweet you make. So it makes it far more because there you go with a wrong tweet. I wanted to share with you this morning the, the experience I had as uh, head of the Diplomatic Academy of Mexico, the Instituto Matias Romero. Uh, at the turn of the century, it was a long time ago, in the year uh, 2000, uh, which makes me have to confess to you about my 35-year experience in the Mexican Foreign Service. Of course, you can figure it out. I joined the Mexican Foreign Service right after kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in those days, in the uh, long time ago, you know, the turn of the century, it was still back in the last century, it was the Instituto Matias Romero responsible for that thing at that time called public diplomacy. And that uh, I, I started radio programs explaining what Mexican foreign policy was and why we were doing this and the other. And then more, much more interesting, it was I was uh, asked to travel around the country to try to make the issue of foreign policy not only the issue of Mexico City and the experts and a very small intellectual and economic circle, but to try to reach out and to explain what Mexican foreign policy was about. And this was, for me, one of the most fascinating experiences, traveling to every capital of every state. We have 31 states, and of course, the focus always to reach out were the universities. And there I realized that m most, even the students of international relations, the students of economics, the people who would be joining the opening up of Mexico, the change of Mexico having been traditionally a country close to itself that identified protectionism with nationalism turning into a country that had joined free trade first through NAFTA, free trade agreement with our neighbors of North America, and then uh, free trade agreement with Europe and so on and so forth. So, so this incredible change of a country looking inward to a country looking outward had to be projected, had to be understood. So some years later, I matured the idea that uh, somebody somewhere in the foreign ministry had to write the book of the history of Mexican foreign policy so that we Mexicans could understand our own history, why we had behaved in such ways since our independence, how we had established our own personality in the world, having been 
for 300 years a political entity called New Spain and how we had changed to a new political entity in 1821 called Mexico. First, a Mexican empire that uh, went from what today is Oregon and the border with Canada to what today is Panama then changing into the Mexican Republic, and then finally establishing ourselves as what we are today, a federal republic uh, called United States of Mexico. So finally, I, had, uh, I designed the project for myself to ask uh, permission, to ask uh, uh, commission, commission, from the Foreign Ministry to the uh, very uh, important academic institution called El Colegio de México, where I had studied, done my undergraduate studies. To many in Spain, El Colegio de México is something special because originally it was the House of Spain. It was the academic institution founded with all the Republican exiles by President Lázaro Cárdenas in uh, 1939, I think it was founded, to give a job to all the Spanish uh, scholars who emigrated to Mexico. Uh, first, uh, uh, this is uh, shortly. It became, after a few years, many academics went to other institutions giving such an importance of this transmission of knowledge from Spain to Mexico in the 20th century. And El Colegio de México was founded and was the first in institution to have a degree in international relations, which I am a graduate. So I got this to do my own personal project. I got a commission from the Mexican Foreign Service to go to El Colegio de México to write this book that I bring today for the Diplomatic Academy of Spain. And it is the history of Mexican foreign policy in short, where I tried to explain who we are, who, who we have been throughout our history, and why we have acted internationally in such a fashion. And I think this is very important. Uh, because you cannot go out to the world and explain who you are if you don't understand what moves you. Of course, what makes a country's foreign policy? It's a geography, it's history, it's a set of values, it's a set of attitudes, it's a set of positions, it's a set of neighbors you have to define yourself against or before or with. So, uh, my experience I wanted to share with you, I think every diplomatic academy needs a book like this. And uh, it's not easy because nobody, the institution never takes the responsibility. So I took the responsibility to, for myself. And uh, it's not an official book, it's not an official history of Mexican foreign policy or an official pol presentation of what Mexican foreign policy is. But it's very close to. <laughs> and uh, uh, I hope. Uh, those of you interested in Mexico and what Mexico foreign policy is, get a chance to read it. But uh, more than speaking about this, I want to make a point. Before this panel, uh, uh, Emilio Espinosa del Amo spoke of the importance of the country, that it is essentially the country that gives the identity to the products to the policy, to the presence in the world, and certainly this is true. But today, in today's world, we are all part of larger communities. In the case of Mexico, we say we have pertenencias multiples, and I don't know if anybody can help me translate that, but that means we belong to Latin America, and we identify with Latin America in all the polls where Mexicans are asked, which, how do you feel? What, what do you feel you are? And after Mexican, everybody chooses Latin America. And it so happens that when there's an economic crisis in one country, somehow the markets in the rest of the region get affected because whether we like it or not, even the markets are identified as being part of Latin America. We are part of North America, our most important trading partners. 
are in North America are the United States and Canada, and with them, we share our ec economic well-being and we share the line of production. The pro many products are now, many cars, it's very difficult to find the car produced in North America that is not produced part in uh, Mexico, part in the United States, part in Canada. So the well-being of the region and the security of the region is very much identified. But we are part also of a larger community of, of Ibero-American country. And this has to do with culture. This has to do with language. We are part of uh, a group of Spanish-speaking countries. And we try to make Spanish an important international language. And we work together towards that uh, uh, goal. And it is, with language comes a long culture. And with culture come many values. Uh, and there's probably, we are probably one of the most homogeneous regions or cultural entities in the world. We actually speak the same language from uh, Santander to Patagonia. And we can sit down and communicate. And uh, this gives us a set of values. This gives us an identity. And this gives us the important uh, meetings of the Cumbre Iberoamericana. And uh, I will remind all of you that this year we will have the Cumbre Iberoamericana in Veracruz in December, and uh, all heads of states and government of all Ibero-American countries will be attending. And the subject matter of the Cumbre will be culture, because it is important that we uh, celebrate and that we encourage that culture, those languages, the two languages that we share in the Ibero-American community. And let me tell you that as a Mexican ambassador in Spain, I've only been here nine months, it has been a, such an important learning process to understand very much who we are, what Mexico is, in getting to know Spain better. So that has given me an idea of of course, we all know it, but how closely linked we are and how closely linked we look to be in the future, not only because today Spain is the second most important investor in Mexico, after the United States, of course, but because the migration of Spanish people to Mexico today is probably as important in numbers at it, as it was the migration of Spanish people during the Civil War. And if at that time the migration of uh, uh, very well prepared and uh, Spanish gave a special uh, uh, seal, a special component to the Spanish, to the Mexican culture, probably today the migration of this very valuable human capital of Spaniards that moved to Mexico because they work for Spanish companies, of course, that work for, Euro for European companies who choose them because they speak the language or for w international companies, is giving us the human capital, not only the financial capital, not only the technology, but the human cap capital to make a very important leap forward in the modernization of our country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, Amy and I were at a Spanish-US conference over the weekend, and one of the factoids that I picked up, going back to your reference to NAFTA, is that the state of Texas exports more to Mexico than the whole of the US does to the whole of China, by the way. So maybe NAFTA wasn't such a bad thing after all. Simon. social media too, as others have said. It's about the extraordinary reach uh, of social media. Uh, the uh, one billion uh, followers of Facebook, the uh, 700 million odd on Twitter. 
Uh, it's about how social media transforms what we can do as diplomats. And of course, Jerome is right. We have, in a sense, we've always been in the business of doing a little bit more than trying to influence other governments to do what they might not otherwise have done themselves. We've always, to an extent, been in the business of trying to influence the citizens of other countries. But it's what social media, I think, has enabled is a extraordinary kind of exponential growth in the potential for doing all of this. It enables us to engage, and as Jane and others have said, in a genuine two-way communication, not just with other governments, not just with other opinion formers, not just with the people of those countries in which we serve as diplomats, but also with our people back home. And in the case of Britain in Spain, with the 15 million British nationals who visit this country every year uh, and the half a million uh, who have chosen to live here permanently. That is a transformational change in the nature of di uh, diplomacy. It's a transformational uh, change also picking up Jane's comments about the way that Australian diplomacy has changed, it's transformation in the way that we can deliver services. Back in the UK, we talk about a principle that we apply across government as a whole, which is digital by default. That is to say, every single interaction between the state and the citizen can and should be digitalized unless there is some overriding operational reason why it cannot be. Not just because it's cheaper, but actually, in most cases, because our citizens prefer it and we are providing a better service to our citizens uh, in so doing. And as we uh, look at how we can do public diplomacy in this new global age, in this new world of digital diplomacy, um, I apply four principles to it. Audience, access, assets, and autonomy. Audience, who is it that we are trying to reach? Access, how is it that we are trying to reach them? Assets, what is it that we can draw upon in order to reach that audience. And autonomy, how is it that we empower our diplomats, not just our ambassadors, as others have said, but our diplomatic services to reach those audiences in the most effective way possible? Let me just briefly do those four principles one by one. Audience, as I've suggested, changing because we can reach people through social media with an effectiveness that we couldn't do before. And let me focus just on one particular group. British nationals, in our case, living, traveling overseas. Here in Spain, we have seven separate Twitter channels, three separate Facebook channels, plus Instagram and YouTube. And we have those different channels because we can address different groups of audiences. Spanish audience, a business audience, British visitors, British residents. And in the case of those British visitors or residents, we can reach them quicker in an emergency than ever before. In the case of the, the moment of the Boston bombings, we were able to get out Twitter messages to British nationals who might have been in the area of those bombings within minutes of those occurring telling them what they should do, how they should keep themselves safe. In the case of British nationals traveling here, we were able to, working with social media, to try and keep them safe, to ensure that their holidays, their stay here, whether it's for one day, one year, or 10 years, is as happy and secure as possible. We produced a video with the help of the Mossos, Guardia Civil, Policia Nacional, on the dangers of carjacking. Uh, on the motorways down uh, from the French-Spanish border through Barcelona. 100,000 hits 
enabled by a partnership, not just with those agencies who provided us with the footage to show what the dangers were and how people could avoid them, but also with partnerships with the British Automobile Association uh, and with one of the British TV companies who uh, publicized that video, giving us a reach to those nationals that we couldn't possibly have had through traditional media. Uh, access, understanding not just who it is we want to reach, but how we can uh, reach them, how we can uh, enable those people to give our diplomatic effort greater effect. Uh, another example, practical example of that uh, is the conference that we ran just a couple of months ago in London on ending sexual violence uh, in conflict. And in order to uh, make that conference a success, we needed to work with governments, of course. But we needed to find people who could amplify our messages, enable us to reach those points, those bits of the military, of civil society, that we could not otherwise reach simply as government. And so we partnered with some celebrities, famously Angelina Jolly, a very helpful person to have on side if you're trying to reach the world's media, but also with the Pope. Uh, we had, in the course of uh, that uh, conference, 120,000 tweets about that conference with one million views. Not a substitute for the traditional op-eds, private diplomacy, but an extraordinary amplifier of messages enabling you to reach audiences uh, more effectively and in a more diverse fashion. Assets. As others have said, our job is no longer just influencing other governments, it's promoting our brands. It's understanding your brand, it's being as ambassadors, as Jerome and others have said, being authentic, being true to yourself, and also reflecting, I'm afraid as an ambassador, there's not a lot of distinction between your private life and your public life. And actually, sometimes your private life can be a helpful part of creating, establishing your brand. Uh, so sometimes having your daughters at uh, a One Direction concert uh, helps you publicize a little bit of British creativity and it makes your daughters very happy too because they've got themselves on, on Twitter. Uh, but it is about uh, how you manage that brand. And it, that, that, as uh, Jane says, you're in the same business as an advertising agency, as a big corporation. That requires knowing what you can do, what you can't do, with whom and with uh, whom you can't do it. In the UK, we came upon our great brand, I have to say, almost by accident. Uh, it was a brave choice uh, by our then culture secretary, Jeremy Hunt, at the time of the run-up to the Olympic Games, that actually we should invest a bit uh, in our brand, that we had an extraordinary opportunity provided by the London Olympics, uh, by the Jubilee uh, of Her Majesty the Queen, to portray modern Britain, modern creative Britain. Many people scoffed, said it was uh, a waste of money uh, when we had far greater calls uh, on the national budget at a time of uh, extraordinary economic crisis. Uh, last year, we calculated that for a spend of about 50 uh, million pounds, we got about 600 million pounds worth uh, of advertising out of that brand. Uh, as Jane said, we've been lucky. We had a kind of, we had an easy brand uh, to work with, uh, but it has proved its worth. Lastly, autonomy. And I suspect this is perhaps the most difficult thing for any diplomatic service, any bit of government. Uh, I think that you can only be effective in the world of social media, as others said, if you're interesting. Uh, being interesting requires taking a few risks. It means uh, ambassadors and other diplomats who are out there, whether they're blogging or tweeting, being true to themselves, being authentic, being funny, being sad, showing human emotion because it's about interacting with other human beings. Sometimes it goes wrong. Famously, our ambassador in Chile uh, thought he was direct messaging a friend when he uh, questioned the masculinity of the Argentine football team. <laughs> He wasn't. He was tweeting to his 20,000 uh, supporters, uh, which quickly went viral. Uh, when our embassy in Washington the other week uh, tweeted out a photograph of a large cake in the shape of the White House with some candles in it 
to commemorate the uh, 300th anniversary of the burning of Washington uh, by the British fleet, <laughs> they perhaps didn't quite uh, know the media reaction to it. But unless, as a diplomatic service, you are actually willing and able to believe that if you've been chosen as an ambassador by your foreign minister, by your prime minister, in our case by our queen as well, people kind of presume you're reasonably competent to do your job. Uh, and presumed competence is a bit of a mantra for us. Uh, and it does require your foreign minister, your prime minister, to trust that you're going to be able to do your job on social media just as in every other part of your job. And if it, it is by empowering your ambassadors, your diplomats, to use their experience, their expertise, their creativity, and as Jerome said, their sense of how that message, the central message out of London, out of Paris, out of Canberra, can be best delivered within your local context. Because nobody back in Canberra or Mexico City or uh, Stockholm is going to know your audience as well as you. Trust your ambassadors. <laughs> Let them speak. And you will have greater effectiveness, greater resonance, greater reach. And without it, I'm afraid, you will sink in the 21st century of digital diplomacy. Thank you very much. It is very difficult to be the, the last of such a prestigious panel. And I also want to thank again our, our host, the Diplomatic Academy, and the and Pano Royal Institute. Uh, I am going to try not to cover ground that has already been covered, but perhaps add a few uh, different thoughts or thoughts from the US perspective of how we organize our public diplomacy efforts and uh, how we also try to put together these various elements of uh, social media, traditional outreach in media, cultural education. Uh, for us, it is all in, in one package. It is all in one office in our embassies. And I would like to just point out, too, that when you come into our State Department, uh, you are able to come in as a public diplomacy officer. It is one of our five major career paths within, uh, within the State Department. So I think that also is a, is a bit different from many of the other diplomatic services. That also, I would, I would say, is why, that, why I'm here today, um, also representing our Counselor for Public Diplomacy, who is coming from Washington but has been delayed. But uh, I am here today uh, rather than Ambassador Costos um, because we do consider the public diplomacy track, as with our other tracks, quite specialized. Ambassador Costos is a master, I think, in public diplomacy. He's very active on uh, Twitter and Instagram and extremely effective in, in personal uh, communication, one-on-one -on -one communication. Uh, but as far as uh, speaking of the, the role of public diplomacy and a bit of the history, and the strategy of public diplomacy in the State Department, we opted for someone from our public diplomacy office because, as I mentioned, it is a specialized area within the State Department. I'd like to also mention, as a strong advocate and believer in public diplomacy, um, now the, uh, when, as I mentioned, when people come into the State Department, go over, go through the whole testing and examination process, they are allowed to indicate a preference of a particular area, whether it be political, economic, uh, consular management, or public diplomacy. And uh, very rapidly, public diplomacy has um, reached to the very top of the um, competitive area. Uh, it's very popular with people coming into the State Department along with the political track. I think that's because, as many people have said, the lines are quite blurred. When I came in, it was very clear the difference between uh, private or traditional diplomacy and uh, the work that we were doing, which we then called the US Information Service uh, before. The, the reuse of the term public diplomacy, which has actually been around for, for decades. Uh, and people have seen how much that has changed, and every, every uh, person within the embassy uh, does engage in public diplomacy. Uh, we, however, uh, spend more time in that area in our career. There is a public diplomacy trade craft, and we have quite a lot of training and preparation for our public diplomacy officers. Uh, before coming to Spain, I was head of our public diplomacy training section in our Foreign Service Institute, which is our diplomatic academy, where everyone coming into a public diplomacy job, whether they are a public diplomacy officer or they are from a different uh, track, as we say, and have worked in other areas of the embassy, will have to go through training in preparation for their job, going out to be a press attaché, a cultural attaché, 
or for us, <clears throat> the head of the public diplomacy section, which is the public affairs officer or counselor for public diplomacy. That's another difference that I would like to mention that is, seems to be certainly um, a little bit different from some of my European colleagues, and I expect in other embassies around the world as well, that our cultural operation and our press operation are all housed in the public diplomacy office. We do not have a separate cultural institute. Uh, that has historically been the case uh, with the US government for, for many reasons, and there have been debates on and off over the years that we should move the cultural aspect out and create a cultural institute, perhaps partner with the Smithsonian Institution or some other institution in the United States. But we have not, uh, we have not done that. Our cultural operations are housed within our public diplomacy office and, our, and being cultural attache actually is a very broad area of activities. In Spain and in, in much of Western Europe, we do relatively little in the cultural field, straight cultural field, because so many activities do go on, as some of my predecessors have mentioned too, go on by themselves with various American and Spanish organizations. And there is not much, we, we certainly want to be helpful and want to participate, but that is happening um, in those uh, private capacities uh, and running along just fine. Um, we then tend to do more here in the educational side, English language programs, um, and in policy programs. Uh, we work with Elcano, Oil Institute, Casa America, and other of our institutional partners on topics of interest to the embassy um, and to we, uh, we also to our Spanish partners, which may be along the lines of intellectual property rights, the TTIP negotiations, um, security issues, countering violent extremism, um, a wide range of policy-oriented issues that many would not traditionally think would be run by the cultural office, um, but we are actually as much of a program and activities and outreach office as, as the cultural, cultural section. Uh, I would also like to mention, we talked a lot about, uh, people have talked a lot about social media, uh, and just two words on that. It's obviously a very important part of what we do. Um, but it's not the overall driving force of what we do. It is an element. It's an element of every program and every activity now. And it's been interesting, having been back in Washington <clears throat> at our diplomatic academy, noticing that the heavy lift it took to get the bureaucracy of the State Department to warm up to the idea of social media. We were public diplomacy, as you can imagine. Our area was in the forefront of that along with a very innovative actor at the State Department that Secretary uh, Hillary Clinton brought in, Alec Ross, we were just talking about him, who really also helped to push the State Department forward a bit. It's very hard in a very hierarchical structure to, again, give the trust, to uh, think about something that is, is reaching out much more at a grassroots level and cannot have, does not have time to go through several layers of clearances before you know, you are, you're posting it. Uh, and now we are, I think, more at the point, oh, and I would mention that um, the State Department was identified among the government agencies as being the most active and most in the forefront in social media. Um, so I think that, that, that push by all of us to, to get the bureaucracy moving really did make a, a quite a, a difference and it had an effect. But we are at the point now, too, where we were after this big effort to push everything out, get going, uh, get on all the different platforms and formats. Now we are more in the analysis phase of trying to decide what is really effective. How do we reach our audiences? How do we have a voice that's separate from every other voice, every other embassy, every other institution that's out there? Certainly our message to ambassadors also is that their, their uh, tweets uh, or whatever their social media presence might be has to be personal. But many of people, uh, some people are digital natives and very comfortable with this. Others are not, and it takes a while to to find that that uh, sweet spot where people are comfortable with that kind of outreach. And we are also always trying to identify what is the best and most effective way of of social media outreach. I would like to stress too that in our public diplomacy operation, uh, we all we always start from the strategy. Um, the strategy comes first, the audience, and then the activity. Uh, we have uh, very short-term, medium-term, and long-term ideas. When we are looking at public diplomacy, we submit a general public diplomacy strategy uh, to Washington. Every country does every year. We define themes, four or five themes every country does in conjunction with the front office, with the ambassador's office, uh, and the rest of the mission and the country team on what those strategies are going to be. Naturally, those themes and strategies are direct in concert with the rest of the mission. Here in Spain, we are doing quite a lot on entrepreneurship, for example. We work very closely with our economic 
office and our commercial service on different kinds of programs looking at entrepreneurship. For the public diplomacy side and my side, we were doing quite a lot with entrepreneurship with youth, for example, more high school and university level, while our econ economic colleagues are working at uh, more business to business and policy level. Uh, we also, and youth in general, is, uh, is an audience for the, the State Department, uh, public diplomacy, and other offices as well, I would mention, around the world. We are looking to reach out to populations that perhaps have not had the opportunity to learn about the United States other than through the vast you know, popular culture and media coverage of the United States. So we are looking for communities in Spain and other countries that perhaps don't have an opportunity to go to the United States for tourism, to study in the United States, to give opportunities for, for people to learn about the United States in a more human and direct way. One of my colleagues likes to say, we try to take the foreign out of foreign policy in the sense that our public diplomacy is aimed at reaching individuals, uh, creating a dialogue between, uh, between our countries and between our peoples. It is, uh, we do have institutional partners, but the ultimate goal is always to be talking to people directly and reach them and help them sort of try to sift through the vast, vast array of information that is out there about the United States to bring them into contact more directly with an experience in the United States, whether they're there or here, bringing Americans to interact with Spaniards here or sending Spaniards to, uh, to the United States. I don't want to get into details also because of time of, of the various um, programs we have, but we have, I think many of you are very familiar, for example, with the Fulbright program. We have many programs. Around the world, there are about 140 uh, programs through our Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs that some are active in some parts of the world, in some countries, some not. Um, quite, a, quite a wide variety, as, as you can imagine, uh, and, and aimed at all different kinds of sectors and, and populations. Um, I also would just want to finish by, by um, many of us have gone back in history and talked about how public diplomacy started. We like to think of Benjamin Franklin as our first uh, public, uh, public diplomat. Um, but one of our, my personal heroes and one of, uh, one, a person who is cited quite often um, by practitioners of the U.S. public diplomacy is Edward R. Murrow. He was a very accomplished journalist. You may uh, know of him. Uh, he was also the director of the former USIA in the 1960s. Uh, and he always talked about the crucial link in international exchange or in public diplomacy is the last three feet, which is bridged by personal contact, one person talking to another. In this day of social media, in many ways, we are trying to reach out more personally, even if it's digitally, to connect with people. But we always also try to remember that, that very human interaction that is so important to all of us. We also, if I can cite him one more time before I, before I end, we also believe very strongly in, um, in our public diplomacy being truthful. As he said, to be persuasive, we must be believable. To be believable, we must be credible. And to be credible, we must be truthful. And that is a, a tenant of our work uh, every day as well. I'd like to stop now because in the interest of time, but I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. Well, we're very fortunate. I think we've had six very complimentary um, presentations this morning. I'm going to use my supreme dictatorial powers uh, to extend the uh, duration of this session slightly with the uh, director's permission. Um, and what I'd like to do is to ask a couple of, raise a couple of questions that perhaps our speakers can address and then throw this open to the floor. First of all, I'd like to make a few rash, rather sweeping generalizations, um, which you may or may not agree with. Um, listening to you all, um, my impression is that basically public diplomacy uh, has forced us, whether we like it or not, to operate in a context which has been determined by three phenomena. The first, of course, is globalization. I mean, how can we have a serious seminar without mentioning the G word, for God's sake? Um, and when we talk about globalization in this regard, what I would emphasize is what m some people are describing as the transformation of power. I'm going to contradict my boss, which is one of my favorite pastimes. Um, earlier, he said, Emilio Lama de Spinoza said that um, the world remains state-centric. And he is true, he, he, this is true, this, he's right in a way, but at the same time there has been a transformation of power, as Moises Naim's book reminds us. Um, he may, Moises Naim may have gone too far when he talks about the end of power. 
I, I would argue that uh, nation states remain much more powerful than Moises' name would acknowledge. But nevertheless, power like energy has this curious ability tra to transform itself. Um, and therefore, although the, s the nation state remains central to the in international system, it no longer operates in the way in which it used to. My second point is that all of us operate in a context in which traditional political institutions have come under growing scrutiny. Most of our citizens have become increasingly disaffected and they are increasingly critical. And this n is by no means just a Spanish phenomenon. This is a worldwide phenomenon. The way youngsters, the way the people we teach at university respond to national governments, national parliaments, national political parties, I think is very different to what it was, say, 15 or, or, th or 20 years ago. And finally, and this is something we haven't mentioned, but I think this is crucial, there has been a change in the role of traditional media outlets. I teach journalism students at university just across the road, and they don't read the newspapers, which I find slightly alarming, by the way, but... Um, they don't believe, they don't really respond to the tradi traditional media outlets the way we used to. You know, some Spanish newspapers 30, 40 years ago were, played a very prominent role in Spanish political and cultural life, and that is by no means the case anymore. So I think these are the three uh, phenomena w within which one has to um, look at the way we're developing our public diplomacy strategies. And the question I'd like to put to you is, and I think Jerome uh, probably addressed this implicitly, in his uh, very French and clear-cut presentation, um, conceptually very clear presentation, um, when he said, um, when he discussed the, the, the need to know who speaks and also the need to know your audience, and, and Simon and, and the others have also addressed this. My question is basically, do you think there is a contradiction between public diplomacy and conventional diplomacy? Is there a danger that public diplomacy may actually obscure or interfere with traditional um, so-called, if you like, serious or, or mainstream uh, uh, diplomacy. And the reason I ask this is because um, some people would actually like public diplomacy to transform diplomacy wholesale, and others seem to regard this as, as a danger, you know, that, that we may be losing sight of the fundamentals and that national governments, and in, in particular your respective uh, foreign services, may in fact now be performing roles which really um, in more normal circumstances, other institutions could perform better. I'll just um, put that to you, and if anyone wants to, please, Ambassador. I think that the, diploma, the world has changed, diplomacy has changed. This diplomacy is not what it used to be. And uh, we are not sure, at least uh, uh, speaking for myself, or maybe even for my ministry, we are not sure what, the r wh what is that we have to do. How do you define the job of an ambassador? It's not longer engaging in secret negotiations, that's for sure. W I find most of the job we do is public speaking and is where you are apt for the job or not. Uh, many times, conversations, telephone conversations go on between our leaders that we are not necessarily informed of the content. So the role of the job we do, I find it totally different today as 35 years ago when I entered the Foreign Service. You're only shaking his head. Is that because you're involved, uh, involved in the secret diplomacy on a daily basis? Or <laughs> if I was, I would not tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I have other means of finding out, of course. <laughs> I, I, I fully agree with uh, what uh, Roberta is saying about the transformation of the job of uh, the ambassador. But the ambassador is not all diplomacy. Uh, when you talk about the free trade agreement between uh, uh, Europe and the US, for example, mm -hmm. we have a big debate nowadays in Europe to know whether we have to publish the mandate yes. of the Commission or not. It doesn't work. We have a big debate to know whether we must publish the mandate of the Commission or not. There are, ho there are all those who say we need to publish it because citizens have a right to know what we negotiate with the US in a field which is addressing their daily life and the future of our companies. And there are those who say, we cannot publish it, because if we want to make a compromise, we have to keep the negotiation lines mm -hmm. very secret. Same, you talk about public diplomacy, but when you are confronted with a question of hostages, mm. you cannot talk about public diplomacy 
when you are patiently trying to know where your hostages are and if there is a chance for you to bring back uh, your hostages safe home. A third example, when you are talking about what is going on now in Syria, in Iraq, you are doing some public diplomacy because you are addressing about values, about principles, about peace and security. But when it comes to deciding whether or not to deliver arms to some of the insurgent groups, then you are engaged in secret diplomacy in order to uh, do it efficiently. And these are the same people who, at some point in their career, will enjoy uh, the comfortable uh, role of the ambassador in Spain, who is uh, living uh, very, very nicely here. And then you will be sent to Mali or to Central Africa or uh, to Iraq, where you will have to live a completely different life mm. and engage in a completely different sort of um, activity, which is not going to be at all the same as when you are in the other way. Same, and I will uh, finish by that, you will have a session on multilateralism. There, you constantly have uh, a dialogue, uh, a tension, a dialectic tension between public and secret diplomacy. When you, when you for example, negotiate uh, the criminal court treaty, you negotiate in transparency with NGOs, and then at some point, there is the moment of the final deal, and then you bring your colleagues to a door, to a room where there is no telephone, no journalist, no NGO, no camera, and you do what you have to do to give what you need to give in order to receive what you need to receive. And the final deal has to be secret, because at the end, you know that you are going to be uh, asked what happened? And if it has been in the open, there will not be an agreement, whereas, uh, uh, whereas if it has been behind closed door, you have a chance to have an agreement. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, I completely agree with Roberta, but there is still a place for uh, private negotiation mm -hmm. also. Yes, please, Jane. Oh, sorry, Cecilia. Uh, just to quickly Jane. say, yes, I agree with both. Uh, Jerome, you mentioned hostages, and I was going to use the example of hostage taking. It, hostage taking is a, uh, a mercantilist uh, activity. It's all about money. If we have hostages, I've worked in our crisis centre, unfortunately, in ca when you're in Canberra, you get dragooned into the crisis centre on rotation, especially when there's a hostage situation, um, because we have to be on standby 24-7. 20, and the, the sad fact is that the more a hostage situation gets into the media, the higher the price becomes. And we've sometimes taken individual <coughs> journalists aside and said, this is what's happening. You must take into account this person's life. Um, typically, with the, uh, the hostage cases I've heard about or been involved in, is that the price will go from start at $2 million, and if there's media, it'll go up. And if, it, if, if it's then conducted in secret, the price will come down to a very small price, you'd be amazed. But it takes a long time, and that's a very sad and delicate situation. And unfortunately, you know, our journalist friends uh, like to promote their own methods of dealing with things. There's an ego in the media that we have to contend with, and the ego of the international media says, we are the ones actually making a difference. And unfortunately, it's not the difference that one one might think watching these programs on TV. So that's a very delicate uh, kind of situation. Uh, but, but I have to say that I've been 25 years in our foreign ministry and we still have some rules and the main rule is you have to be a director level or above to, to background the media, to be authorised to background the media one-on-one -on -one because you've had more training and the second rule is when you send emails or do personal twitters, you must make it um, known that this is a personal. And in fact, for, for many senior officers, we've actually um, dismantled our personal accounts because it's, well, you get bombarded. 
uh, for a start. And secondly, it's hard to control it. And it, it, I just have an embassy Facebook account and that's my family and friends see me there <laughs> that's that's it really um, it's just easier to control but we have become a far more open and as as Cecilia said at the beginning we have to be on the front foot and be be shaping the agenda because we're dealing with huge international organizations who break the news sometimes before we find out Two comments. Um, I think talking about, I mean, I, I fully agree with Jerome. A lot of things are still done and have to be done discreetly and, and in secret. Uh, what we have found, and especially I think in, in sensitive consular cases, hostage crisis and things, is that if you use your public diplomacy, li diplomacy wisely in advance, you can, ex I mean, we are always com accused, all, all ministries and embassies, that when there's a crisis, silent diplomacy, I mean, we all claim we doing silent diplomacy in, in on an issue and the general public said well that's just a word for the foreign ministry not wanting to do anything not doing anything i think you can you can then use the public diplomacy in in normal <laughs> circumstances explaining to the general public and and to the media what is silent diplomacy what are we doing how do we work on 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 sensitive issues uh, and that i think saves you a lot of work when the actual crisis hits and and there's a better understanding for why you wa have to be very very careful. Um, I also wanted just to mention something about, I think Jerome also said, I mean, uh, you have to be very clear on who is talking. And I think it's very important. I mean, we are here as ambassadors for our country. If I Twitter or I Facebook or I participate in a seminar like this, I'm not presenting the views of Cecilia Julien. I, I try to do it in my personal way, but I, I certainly am here to, to, to present the opinions and, and the views of the, of the Swedish uh, government. And I mean, I think that is very clear also when, when you Twitter that I'm Twittering to present Swedish views. I try to do it in a, in a personal way and maybe in a witty way. And I add some of Slatan Ibrahimovic at times because that gives me more followers. <laughs> and you have to use the tricks like that. But I, I mean, I think it's very important to be clear. I'm talking as the ambassador of Sweden and what I say is official policy. Thank you. Much. Simon, very briefly, and then we'll open it again, also very briefly, to the audience. And turning the on switch on as the uh, key and off. So it's in all these cases, it's about the interaction between the public and the private diplomacy. And, of course, Jane's right. Uh, most of these, uh, most of these cases, the hostage takers are out for money. And sadly, they often get paid, and then they take more hostages, and they buy more arms and more guns and more bombs, and more of our citizens die. Uh, but often, and we've seen it, of course, quite tragically just over the last few weeks, they're out to make a very public point. And this is a very public act, uh, and it's a very ideological act. Uh, and in, that, in those sorts of cases, you too are engaged in that struggle against violent extremism uh, and the abhorrent uh, ideas uh, that they are trying to put out. Uh, and in those cases, I'm afraid your private diplomacy, which in these cases has very little resonance with the likes of uh, the Islamic State of Iraq, uh, actually requires a heavy dose of tough public diplomacy uh, to denounce those acts and to find voices, voices that perhaps have greater resonance and our own governments uh, out there in the world, and particularly in the Islamic world, who can make clear that those sorts of acts are as abhorrent uh, to ordinary Muslims as they are as abhorrent to our own governments and people. And I might say that's a different case. Um, and many of our hostage cases are backpackers and people who are on motorbikes out in other countries. Mm -hmm. But you, Great Britain, Great Britain and the United <laughs> States and others probably have m a much more experience with the ideological hostage taking for obvious reasons. Thank you. Let's take a couple of questions very briefly, I'm afraid, from the audience. Rafael Estrella, Vice President of the Elcano Institute, and perhaps Jan Melsen from Klingendal in the Netherlands, good friend whom I'm very happy to have with us today. Rafael. Th thank you. Well, it was a great panel. Uh, I, I think that uh, it has been stated clearly that uh, diplomacy has changed, has changed a lot. I think that uh, regardless of whether uh, 
number of issues should be uh, or remain under confidentiality through negotiations and through uh, uh, in, in get certain information which is not uh, delivered. Uh, in, 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 in essential, in, in essence, uh, diplomacy has changed dramatically and is made, is made mostly in the open and works in the open. And which reflects more this notion when connected with public diplomacy is the fact that uh, through public diplomacy action, you declare your goals, you declare your intentions, and that's uh, qualifying uh, the diplomacy in the 21st century, which is also related to the end of the Cold War, which allowed us uh, no longer to be hiding uh, certain aspects of, of our intention, and of our goals, but quite on the contrary, as a means to reach out and to create and to build confidence uh, to, to, to show and to, de and to, and to demonstrate uh, our, our goals uh, and our, our, our intentions as a means to enhance predictability, which is, uh, I think is one of the greatest goals in, uh, for, for security and, and, and for, for, for development in, in, in a scenario like Europe. And there are uh, something that uh, I would like you to, to answer, because you all have been talking about a, a strategy, tools, etc. And I think that it was you, the, the representative of the, uh, the American Embassy, who mentioned that uh, you have to build a country strategies. And I agree with that. I think you have to have a grand strategy, common tools, common uh, uh, training, but at the end of the day, is not working. It's not the same working in Spain in public diplomacy as uh, working even in Portugal. Uh, you need another way of addressing. So thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much, Charles, uh, and thanks to the panel um, for coming out. I think it's evidence coming over. I think it's evidence that ambassadors uh, find is very important. Uh, ten years ago, I'm sure you would not have sent the ambassador, him or herself, uh, but rather somebody else. Uh, uh, and public diplomacy has really risen in the list of priorities of, of embassies. Um, I think it's also, the, the, the examples were wonderful, many general themes were drawn out, and I think what's missing is that we have a, a database of, of, of good examples of public diplomacy. There's a lot of potential here for policy transfer and for learning from one another's examples. So that was all very, very interesting. I have two questions. One to the chair, if I may. Oh dear. Uh, I, I've observed on my Twitter, you were not sending tweets while you were chairing, Charles. I know. That's the first time, the first time I found you not on Twitter. And so yes. you're a real person, and the real person is doing the tweeting. Uh, that was an interesting observation. My question to you is linked to a comment uh, um, um, that was made by an ambassador from Sweden. Uh, Swedish um, um, diplomats were thrown into the cold water, uh, you said, by, by Carl Bildt. Uh, um, and you made the very strong point that it's really a different thing when people tweet rather than institutions. Uh, mm. Because that brings, that, that create, has a magnetism and, and makes a, a, a link. Um, so my question to Charles, I have a second question. My second to Charles is, uh, um, do you think, would your recommendation as a think tank uh, uh, to the Spanish foreign ministry uh, be to do the same? Or when do you expect this might happen? that in individuals rather than institutions, embassies or the ministry or a department from, of the ministry uh, 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 join the social media. My second, uh, second question, uh, uh, many important themes were drawn out and I think one theme was low budget public diplomacy. It's, it's, as, as, as Ambassador Hardy said, that's a reality for many embassies and increasingly a reality in Europe and it, it, it makes institutions ambassadors also very uh, imaginative. There is another type of public diplomacy and that is facing crisis. And I was wondering, in the case of Australia, and we've all heard about the eavesdropping of your neighbor's president, uh, uh, um, how, you, how, you've how have you dealt with that in a public diplomacy sense? Thank you very much. Go ahead, Jane. That, that's a very, very good question. Um, we've had not just um, Edward Snowden and we've drawn into our great and powerful friends world of, you know, great, of, um, of the massive events that we're all 
a part of. But uh, we've had Julian Assange, of course, now in the UK. And uh, we've had, as a result... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd just like to put it on the record that every single day the Australian High Commission in London has offered Julian Assange consular assistance and it has been refused. <laughs> um, Yes, those things are very, very difficult and the worst kind of, uh, of, of issues to deal with. And um, it, I can't comment on any intelligence matter. That's the standard phrase. You'll hear it from me because there's very good reasons and you'll hear it from most government officials unless they're speaking off the record. But... Um, the way we dealt with that was just to hold our council. Of course, there was a media storm around it, as there was here in Europe with the case of uh, Mrs. Merkel and, uh, and the American system. But um, this is our most sensitive, closest, most interesting relationship, very, very important to us on many fronts. We work closely together with Indonesia on terrorism and people smuggling, for example, just to show you that we're in this this geographical area which is very sensitive to some of these issues. Now, the issue of phone tapping, uh, you know, I, I don't know the truth of it, but I can see how the media has been dealt with. Um, uh, basically, our government simply uh, did not respond to the allegation. And it, it had to weather this storm. And, of course, what happens is that the... There's the government that you, you deal with, the administration, the president's office and so on, and then there's the parliament or the congress. And quite often people in those parts of the government apparatus do the most shrill kind of response and uh, for whatever reasons, a range of reasons. So we did not respond to those. But recently, and this is only six months later, we've signed a new agreement with Indonesia on these matters. And... Uh, it, it really has been a very important example of how to control the message. Don't just respond to allegations. Work through it, work on the relationship. In a way, hunker down and focus on the people that matter, which, I which is the government, in this case, the government of Indonesia. And develop the relationship through this trial. This is a, a very bad trial that we went through in our relationship. So it was, you'll recall, the wife of the uh, Indonesian president who was the subject of this particular allegation. And um, the president himself, who's now just finished his term uh, two weeks ago, was there at the signing of this agreement between our foreign ministers. So it ended happily. How many people noticed that story about the signing of an agreement? I don't know. But it, it developed our relationship. It actually created an urgency to addressing something which perception, reality or otherwise, was something that had to be addressed. Thank you very much. We're really running out of time, Jan, so perhaps I can answer your question in private. Uh, <laughs> no, I'll say something very briefly. Um, I'll say something very briefly, and then we will have a, a late coffee break. Um, I very much enjoy following Carl Bildt, for example, but... I've sometimes been surprised by some of the things that he tweets, which presumably he hasn't had time to clear with the uh, Prime Minister. This may be because he was a Prime Minister himself, formerly, and he sometimes thinks that he still is the Prime Minister. Um, if Cecilia will allow me to say this. Um, <laughs> and, you know, sometimes he has said things which I think may have landed Swedish diplomacy in the soup, to some extent. He has gone perhaps further than... Uh, his own prime minister and, and his own political party would have wanted him to go. However, he is fresh, he is uh, brave and original, and that is why he has so many followers. Um, uh, Jerome made a very interesting point. I mean, who speaks? Your, your identity has to be clear, and his identity isn't always crystal clear in my mind. Of course, he can say, I am the foreign minister of Sweden, and therefore you should read me uh, in the light of that. But, but you know, th the question behind that is, What's the thought process? What's the decision-making process that's gone behind some of those uh, positions that he adopts? Spain is a newcomer to this field, as you know, and I would certainly um, like the Spanish Foreign Ministry to be a little bit more daring, um, to trust the ambassador, as Simon was saying, to allow 
individual embassies to develop their own profile and their own identity. Um, I have, I'm followed by a lot of the Spanish embassies and they're practically indistinguishable because they're basically just churning out the official message. They don't really adapt their message to the local market, to the local culture, to the local population. So I would like those individual embassy feeds, uh, Twitter feeds, to, to be able to develop their own, their own personality. And I would certainly like the minister to tweet as, as the minister and not just as the foreign ministry because, uh, to be frank, it is rather wooden and rigid. There, so I've landed myself in the soup. And on that note, uh, we will take a quick break. Thank you very much to all of our speakers.